do not take these blessings for granted. Allah is sharing them a parallel that they were better, stronger, richer people than you. And we turned their circumstances because they were arrogant and denied. The Muslims were faced with an army they've never met before. An army of 10,000. And they had nothing in Medina to help them ward off an army of this number. And they weren't just an army of 10,000. This was an army that intended complete destruction. They intended to wipe Medina off the face of this earth. The intent was to remove Islam once and for all. This was the, in this was the intent. Don't let the Eid banquet after 30 days of righteousness be a mixed affair with non mahrams laughing and talking and joking with each other whilst they dress beautifully for one husband to look at another person's wife to the extent that you find some men calling other people's wives by nicknames that their own husbands call them. This is the level of easiness that we have between us and this is not from Islam. Ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan. Allah didn't reveal this in any way. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we request praises and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, we've begun the 21st night of Ramadan as of Maghrib today. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we have now embarked on the final chapter of Ramadan. Our guest arrived. And now we're counting the days to our guest's departure. But our guest being generous doesn't want us to focus on the sadness of the departure. It wants us to focus on the present. And it wants us to benefit as much as we can. And it wants us no doubt to remember that the Allah of Ramadan is the Allah of every month of the year. It doesn't mean that when Ramadan leaves then fasting leaves, recitation of the Qur'an leaves, standing the night in prayer leaves. It doesn't mean any of this. So it's not a month that distills within it the worship of Allah. And then when the month leaves, the worship of Allah leaves as well. By no means or way is this the month of Ramadan. And if this really was Ramadan, then Ramadan wouldn't be kareem. It wouldn't be generous. Now as we begin this night, subhanAllah, there's other blessings that we have. I remember before I departed, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not forbid us from seeing each other's faces. And alhamdulillah, I see many familiar faces, which means Allah preserved us in His obedience, inshaAllah. There are some brothers that are missing, but upon prior follow-up, I've understood they've gone for Umrah, mashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from them. And may Allah inspire them to remember us in the dua. Ameen. Also, with this being the 21st night, Darus Salaam's last 10 nights youth program will kick off. The night arises, uh, inshallah, and the Fajr nights program. So there's two programs kicking off tonight for our youth, given that they're on holiday, for our younger youth and our older youth. And inshallah, you'll hear about that just now, bithinlahi ta'ala. Another thing, and I want to use this as an opportunity, Given that we are in the month of Al-Qur'an and we are in the last 10 nights, one of these nights was the night in which the Qur'an was revealed. Alhamdulillah, very recently, my book on Surah Yusuf was published and released, Alhamdulillah. Now many of you received it, I know, because I've been getting videos and images, Alhamdulillah. But it's the first time that I actually, today, uh, managed to hold it because I just arrived back in the country a few hours earlier. And uh, I wanted to take the opportunity of unwrapping it for the first time, opening it uh, during this eventful night, mashallah, after this eventful ibadah in front of you all, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So mashallah, tabarakallah, this book is uh, an explanation of Surah Yusuf, and it encompasses almost two decades of my journey with the surah. I first started teaching the surah in 2006 or thereabout, 2005 and 2006. And no doubt the inspiration is always when it comes to Surah Yusuf ibn al-Qayyim's statement that Allah has left in the Surah more than 1,000 benefits. But ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he passed away without writing the book with the benefits. So Allah inspired after him people who embarked on this journey and I ask Allah to make me one from, from them. I have a copy in front of me, alhamdulillah. It's the copy that I've opened and what I will do is I will pass it to 
dhakir, he will flip through it and then he will pass it along insha'Allah whilst I present uh, the summary of uh, tonight's uh, reading insha'Allah. Uh, please don't go off with the book, yani. he pass it to the next person, bithinlahi ta'ala. And if you want a copy, inshallah, I will let you know how you can get one. Um, I know the sisters as well, perhaps inshallah, we can get uh, the book to them, bithinlahi ta'ala as well. Today we had the 22nd Jews of the Quran. And predominantly we traveled through four surahs. We started with Surah Al Ahzab, or what remained of Surah Al Ahzab, because yet last night you started the surah with our Imams during um, the 20th night of Ramadan. So we started with the remainder of Surah Al-Ahzab. Thereafter, we went to another Surah, Surah Saba'. Surah Saba can, be, can have a sting like Surah Al-Nahl. <laughs> surah Al-Nahl also has a sting. When I, surah Al-Nahl is a Surah of the Bee. So I say sting because those who are reading Taraweeh, when it comes to Surah Al-Nahl generally, they see whose portion is it. Because Surah Al-Nahl has mutashabihat, it can sting you a little bit if you, if you're half it and, you know, uh, the hift wasn't strong at the time when you were memorizing. Surah Saba can have that as well. Although our Hafid Dhakir, MashaAllah, Allah bless him, uh, he's, strong, he's a strong Hafid, Alhamdulillah. After that, Alhamdulillah, we moved on to Surah Al-Fatir. And uh, Hafid Hamdala, uh, he pursued Surah Al-Fatir after Hafid Dhakir began it. And then, alhamdulillah, we had Surah Yaseen at the end, and who doesn't know Surah Yaseen? But we only started Surah Yaseen, insha'Allah, we will complete Surah Yaseen tomorrow. Now, Surah Al-Ahzab, very quickly, is called Surah Al-Ahzab predominantly because of a historical event. And I'm sure we all know of a battle, I pass it to your right, are you passing to your right? No. Uh, we all know of a famous battle known as the Battle of the Trench. The Battle of the Trench, or also known as Al-Ahzab, Al-Ahzab, in which the Quraysh and the Ghattafan surrounded Medina with collaboration, with the collaboration of the hypocrites and the Jews, in particular Banu Quraydha. And this was a very tri trying time for the believers, because the Muslims were faced with an army they've never met before, an army of 10,000. And they had nothing in Medina to help them ward off an army of this number. And they weren't just an army of 10,000. This was an army that intended complete destruction. They intended to wipe Medina off the face of this earth. Their intent was to remove Islam once and for all. This was the, in this was the intent. It was one of those situations where we say enough is enough. It was 13 years of their maneuvers and propaganda campaigns against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca. Then he went to Medina. And in Medina things began to grow. And not only did it begin to grow, but we see Muslim civilization kicking off. We see the first Muslim city. We see the Muslim state and the functions of the state coming to be. There was a progressive system that didn't even exist in Mecca. You had Masjid al-Nabawi, which was the center of all affairs. It was the Ministry of Da'wah, it was the Ministry of um, Health, it was the Ministry of Education, it was the Ministry of Public Affairs and um, Media. All this took place from Masjid al-Nabawi, it was, it was center. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would gather in Masjid al-Nabawi with the Sahaba and Shura used to take place. It was Parliament if I may use the term. He would sit here and this is where the Shura discussions would happen. In fact, after the battle of Uhud, the injured from Uhud were brought to Masjid al-Nabawi and this is where they were treated. And thus I say the Ministry of Health. We know that Abu Huraira was from the graduates, the alumni of Masjid al-Nabawi. He was from Ahl al-Sufa. He used to live in the Masjid because there were no more homes of the Ansar for the Muslims to be placed with. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam let them stay in the Masjid. So you can say it was the, also the Ministry of Social Affairs. Subhanallah. So we had the Masjid. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had treaties. He had treaties with the Jews, the surrounding people, with these faith-based communities. Or the Jews, were, or they were a faith-based community, had a treaty with them. A treaty of cooperation and a treaty of defense as well, of support. Right? So, and there were other things that were happening. So obviously for the Quraysh, this was far too progressive than they anticipated. That not only was Islam spreading, but now it had a system. 
Islam had a home to spread its wings to the rest of the globe. And it was taking away from the limelight of Mecca. Mecca didn't have this. Mecca had ignorance. Mecca had darkness. Mecca had jahiliyyah. The Quraysh was still upon their ways of gambling and alcohol and treating women as commodity and so on and so forth. They had all of this. But Medina, subhanallah, it had common sense. It had rationale. It had a system. It had sustainability. It had a legal system, a justice system. It wasn't the system of the Quraysh. So the Quraysh really intended to change the geographical landscape of the globe. And if I can tie events to what's happened in our recent past, the end of 2023 and October the 7th, it's, you find the similar kind of sentiment that it is a people and a nation wanting to ultimately wipe out an area off the face of the globe. That's what you can see. And they amassed 10,000 for this. Now this was a trying time for the believers because Medina wasn't yet rich. The Sahaba were still managing things. And when you have less financial resources, you need to apply a lot of physical resources. So naturally it makes you tired. And they didn't have the numbers. They didn't have the artillery. They didn't have the weaponry. They didn't have the animals to manage this. Nor the horses, nor the camels. They didn't have this. Even if they put all the animals together, it wouldn't match what was coming to meet them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sits in Masjid Nabawi with the Sahaba. And he engages in the process of shura. Parliament is active. And there's no great ideas. Everybody, um, the Sahaba were never a people who were despondent. But in this particular case, just for the sake of being practical, there were no ideas that really were sound. Except one from the Persian companion, Salman, who said, look, in Persia, when they fight the Romans and they meet these large armies, they disturb their movement. How? By digging trenches. But you've got to remember, these are experienced trench diggers. And then it's not a case of them having camels and horses. They have elephants with them. They have weaponry with them. They have metal and steel with them. This is something they can do. The Muslims didn't have experience, they didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the animal power, resource power, they didn't have this. But they had no choice and the Prophet ﷺ in light of seeing no other idea that would beat the idea of Salman, he opted for it. Now you have to understand that this would entail great effort from the Muslims. And they dug. We're talking about a trench that was meters deep and kilometers wide. It's not this little part that you see when you go to Medina known as the Sab'a Masajid. Takes you on the bus and you just see this little hilltop and they say this is where uh, the, the Khandaq. They say this is where the battle of the trench took place. This is just a portion of it. This is where the battalions were stationed. And it's to highlight to you how severe the matter was that they couldn't pray as one jama'ah. You have seven places of prayer so close to each other. So in close proximity, you can see seven places of prayer. That's what Sab'a Masajid means. Seven places where they congregated to pray. This is how intense the battle was. Nobody could leave their post. And not only this, when the Quraysh finally arrived, obviously the battle didn't begin because they were faced with a shock themselves. They didn't have this experience before facing a trench in front of them that acted as an obstacle between them and the enemy. So it lasted. They camped. And the Muslims had to be diligent and vigilant for a long period of time. They were low on energy, they were low on food, and they still had to stay awake. They still had to uh, be diligent, they still had to be active, they had to be focused. This took a toll. On top of this, you have the hypocrites who want the other side to win. So they're trying to disunite the Muslim ranks. And they use the same tool that shaitan uses. Pull you to the dunya. Tell you about your wives. Tell you about your children. Make you scared that perhaps at the back, they're harming them. Your two women are going to be raped and your children are going to be taken as slaves. So now you buy the place of the trench and you, half your mind and heart is somewhere else. This was happening. Then there was the Jews, Banu Qurayza. The Muslims didn't dig a trench on their area because the Arabs... If anything, even though they had this ignorance, they wouldn't break treaties. Even though they had this jahiliyyah, this darkness to them, there were certain traits they had that were praiseworthy. When it came to treaties, they would maintain it. Nonetheless, 
the Jews who the Muslims thought, well, with one eye and one ear, that we don't need to dig a trench there because they are there and we have a security pact with them. They will not allow the Quraysh to enter Medina from there. They started entertaining the idea. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was heavy for the Muslims and Allah tells us in Surah Al-Ahzab how difficult this was. Allah says, إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ When they came to you from above, وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ And from underneath, وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ The matter was so severe for you, O oh Sahaba, O oh Muslims, إِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ You couldn't even focus your eyes. Well, you know what happens when you fear and there's so many things going on and you're overwhelmed, your eyes start looking all over the place? Because you're constantly thinking there's a thousand thoughts going on in your head. Allah is describing us, He's painting an image of what was happening. This is known as a taswir al-Qur'ani, the imagery of the Qur'an. Subhanallah, this is happening for us in Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah is telling us about the Sahaba, those who are with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those who had the highest iman the Ummah will ever experience. Allah is telling us of how hard He tested them. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ Allah says, we tested you so hard, not only were your eyes wayward, but your heart was beating so hard, you felt it was in your throat. We say this in the English language. Allah says, وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبَ الْحَنَاجِرِ Your heart reached your throats. Then Allah says, subhanallah, that not only this, Allah knows what was happening in your heart. You dare not say it, but Allah saw it in your heart. وَتَذُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ You started entertaining thoughts of, about Allah that you never ever entertained before. Meaning even the trust you had in Allah was starting to shake. That is how hard you were tested. Allah says, هُنَالِكَ بْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ That was when we truly tested the believers. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا And we shook them a great shaking. Subhanallah. Allah describes this for us. We think of our brothers and sisters in Gaza. They are being shaken a great shaking. Subhanallah. Hmm? The test of Allah has come upon them from above and from, within, from underneath. And we see the eyes. We hear the screams. We hear the heartbeats from the throat. Allah indeed is testing them. But as I read to you these verses of Surah Al-Ahzab, and I reveal to you the story of the Ahzab, I sometimes think to myself, are the people of Gaza being tested harder? Or is it you and me? Who is being tested harder? Is it the people of Gaza or you and I? Subhanallah. Because the people of Gaza are being true to the Iman. And the Ummah testifies to this because we see the images. But what are we doing, my brothers and sisters in Islam? What movement have we made to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What journey have we made to the mandates of the Quran and the Sunnah? What retraction have we made from sin and vice? What efforts have we made to correct those within our sphere of influence? Or is it business as usual and life as normal? Are we still living through Ramadan, waiting for the end of Ramadan to return to our old ways? That I'm on a hold of Netflix now, for now, but when, after Eid I'll check which are the new movies that were released in it. For now I'll be patient. Is that our mandate? Who is being tested greater? Because this Ummah is one body. When one part is affected, the rest of the body reacts. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there's a reaction. There's a reaction. And he likens it to fever and sleepless nights. Wallahi, where's our sleepless nights? Where are our sleepless nights? We still complain about the taraweeh being too long or too short, or the imam having extra tasbih in his ruku or sujood. Not you, of course. But in general, this is a general remark that we hear. So, are they being tested or are we being tested? Because as they are being tested, rest assured, Allah is going to hold us also accountable. He's going to call us all. That you are part of the ummah at the time when I shook a portion of you. What did you do? That perhaps you adopting one sunnah, even if it was as small as putting a miswak in your pocket to use during the day, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used it, that could have been the means maybe of one child being pulled out of the rubble alive. The barakah of that act, maybe. Have you ever thought about it like that? That maybe the extra du'as that you were making, instead of shying away from making it or burning out with regards to your du'as, was a means 
of a building surviving an explosion and hundreds of people having their lives intact just because of one dua that you made. That maybe you chose to release yourself from the chains of culture that tied you to ideas that the Quran speaks against directly. And because of that, subhanallah, a family was saved in Gaza after a bombing. Don't underestimate the barakah of ta'a and righteousness, brothers and sisters in Islam. So if we talk about Surah Al-Ahzab, then I'm presenting to you Surah Al-Ahzab. That there are verses that are read, but these are deductions that, that the Quran throws out at us. And throws out to us, because the Quran is a guide. So as things are happening, we need to see the reaction. We need to see the reaction. The masajid need to get fuller. That, that's a reaction. People get, subhanallah, the Muslims are reacting. They're turning back to their Lord. But wallahi, let's be honest. It's still a case of they are there, we are here. Alhamdulillah. May Allah make everything easy for them. Brothers and sisters in Islam, you know what Surah Al-Ahzab is telling us? That if you want Islam to be honored, if you want the honor to come back to the Muslims, I don't want to use the word sacrifice. You know I don't like that word. Because that entails you giving up something for nothing. You know, when you give for Allah, He always gives you back. It's always investment, right? But you need to spend a bit of yourself. You need to become a bit uncomfortable. You cannot expect honor to come to this ummah whilst you are comfortable. You cannot. It can never happen. If you wake up every day and Islam is there, but after the 60,000 other things I have to do of the dunya, then you are thinking wishfully. This is not how Izza and honor comes to the ummah. This is what Surah Al-Ahzab is telling us. That you want Izza to come, you have to be a part of the system. It has to be on your mind, in the front of your mind, in the middle of your mind, the back of your mind, the front of your heart, the back of your heart, the middle of your heart. How you raise your kids, how you speak to your parents, the discussion you have with your friends, the reprioritization of your hobbies and your timetables. This is where Izza comes to the Ummah. Because now you've made Islah al-Ummah, Islah al-Nas, Ta'aziz al-Deen, honor of the Deen, and raising the Ummah at the forefront of your, mere, of your existence. So that your existence becomes a substantial existence, not a mere existence. But unfortunately, we still have this, my job, my this, my travel, you know, back home, Pakistan, India, where, where, I'll do this, my land, etc., etc., etc. And yeah, if I have extra, then yeah, for Islam, and we wish for Islam, Izza. Look at the whole zakat discussion today. I was just with the brothers and sisters in Malaysia. I was there for the last weeks. I was having the same discussion with them. That every little chance to do good, we ask, is it zakat applicable? Yeah, salam. Zakat applicable. Is this the only propensity you have for your Lord? A pillar of Islam which he made obligatory upon you and gave you no choice in. This is the only scope you are willing to operate within in terms of your financial worship. When in actual fact zakah is somebody else's money in your account, who are you to say is it zakah applicable? <laughs> it is, it's already somebody else's money in your account. You have the burden of getting it out of your account. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, and I think I've mentioned this to you before. Zakah wasn't a Ramadan endeavor for them. Zakah was in Muharram or Rajab. The books of fiqh list, list Ramadan as the weakest view in terms of it being the month for Zakah. It's not a problem to make it uh, Ramadan. But the pious before us, who Allah praises in Surah Al Ahzab, they gave out their Zakah before Ramadan so they could focus in Ramadan on Sadaqah. Because they knew that this is the Ummah of all nations. And previous nations, Allah told them to pay 10% in zakah. But we are a special nation. And even in our laws, Allah shows us that we're special. That Allah will make us pay 2.5 because we will pass 10% by ourselves. But are we there? We struggle just to hit 2.5. And we want the rules to change to make a non-zakatable project zakatable. Because we can only help it from zakah. So if this is our mindset, then we're going against the mere ayat of Surah Al-Ahzab. There's so much to say from Surah Al-Ahzab, we haven't even gone to the next Surah, Allah al Tayyib, Surah Al-Ahzab, 73 verses, and it is a Madani Surah. And as I told you before, I left Madani Surahs are filled with legislation because they were re revealed after Hijrah when Islam had a state. Now what is the relationship between Surah Al-Ahzab and the Surah before? What's the Surah before Al-Ahzab that you had? Surah Sajda, Ahsant. 
Allah knows best. If we look at the end of Surah Sajda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be defiant against the way of the disbelievers and to patiently await their appointed punishment. This is what we see at the end of Surah Sajda. I think you can see where I'm coming from now because Al Ahzab, what does it tell us? At the end of Surah Sajda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the Messenger a command. A command to be defiant against the way of the disbelievers and to be patient. Wait for Allah's plan. The punishment is coming, wait for it. At the opening of Surah Al Ahzab, Allah commands the Messenger towards taqwa and not falling prey to the way of the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Kafirina wal munafiqeen. By following, strict, by following strictly what Allah revealed to him and for him to place his trust in Allah. Look at the connection. An end and a beginning. Even though one surah is from an era and Surah Al Ahzab is from another era. This is the eloquence of the Quran. Wallahi, no one can do this. Over 23 years, everything being pieced together was such tapestry, fine tapestry. It could only be from the Lord of the Worlds. So this is the relationship. Then, in terms of the contents of the surah, then as we said, it's filled with legislation. From them, we find laws pertaining, and this is unique to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala settles the affairs of the prophetic household. Now, this was a ripe time. Allah sets the affairs straight of the prophetic household. And in effect, every Muslim household. Because if these laws apply to our mothers, the mother of the believers, then no doubt every female after them, because who can be more righteous than them? If they are the righteous of the righteous, the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop, and they are told to observe certain matters, that no doubt every female after them, this applies. Min babi awla, in the first instance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Ahzab begins also, well, not begins, but continues cancelling some of the norms of jahiliyyah, such as adoption or tabanni, adoption when you change the name and lineage of the child that you adopted. This was cancelled in the Quran. Then dhihar, this was another prominent thing during jahiliyyah where a husband would liken his wife to the back of his mother, meaning making her haram for him, but keeping her locked in the marriage. Allah abolished this. Also, the belief that the people of Jahiliyyah had that a human being has two hearts. Allah abolished this understanding in Surah Al-Ahzab. And also, that the, the, the belief that they had of the waiting period of a female who is divorced before consummation of the marriage takes place. This was also dealt with in Surah Al-Ahzab. Also, we find the rules of hijab being compulsory upon the wives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the female believers coming down. This is in Surah Al-Ahzab. And we also find evidence of salawat upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it being a part of the faith. We find this in Surah Al-Ahzab. And then we move on to Surah Saba. I'm going to just do a quick run through and then we'll touch on some key ayat. In Surah Saba, we find a different genre of knowledge because from a Medinan surah, you jump to a Meccan surah. So you went, you're reading the Quran, you come into Surah Al-Ahzab, it's heavy, law, 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 law. And just when you feel it might be too much, Allah brings a Meccan surah consisting of 54 verses. And in it, we see the genre of ilm pertaining to ayat before revelation, which we know focus on what? Tawheed, belief in the hereafter, establishing the messenger as the messenger, belief in the Quran as being God sent, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see this balance between Iman and action. Iman and action. That when people fail, and you can deduce this from how Allah has put, if we go with the view that the, the, the order of the surahs was from Allah, because there's two opinions of the scholars. Who put the surahs in the order? Was it the consensus of the Sahaba? Or was it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And scholars opine that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was known during the final Ramadan. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam revised the Qur'an twice with Jibreel. When the final abrogations happened and the Qur'an was set in final. So the order was how it was. And that's how the Sahaba laid it out. Wallahu A'lam. But irrespective, if it was with the Ijma of the Sahaba, then it's God inspired. Because an Ijma cannot happen. The Ummah will never ever settle upon a matter of misguidance. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That if this ummah settles on something that Allah inspires all the hearts to agree, then that is godly inspired. 
So you, if you deduce from this, how we find in this surah, a Makki, a Madani surah with legislation followed by a Makki surah, you see this, that if a person feels difficulty in implementing the, le the legalities of Islam, then it has a direct connection to the weakness of the Iman. The stronger the Iman, the easier it is for you to apply the laws. The weaker your Iman, the harder it is for you to apply the laws. So if the laws of hijab are hard for you, the laws of the home are hard for you, then go to Surah Sabah and build your Iman. <laughs> and you will come back to Ahzab and you'll be able to follow it. For Allah establishes His oneness in this Surah. Why is it called Surah Sabah? Sabah, again, this is one of the Surahs that are connected to a historical event. And we said the Quran time and time again pushes us to read history by naming surahs after historical events. And Saba refers to the kings of Yemen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with much. Gardens and fruits and wealth and financial standing and material well-being and sovereign rule and, 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 and then arrogance took over. And when arrogance took over, Allah flipped their blessings and the blessings became a curse. And this is a message to the Quraysh that you have your power, People love Mecca, they're coming to the Kaaba, they see you as custodians of the Kaaba. You have an automated marketplace because people want to come to you anyway. You don't have to market, you don't have to advertise. The latest slippers from Yemen, the latest cloth from Syria is going to come to your market because they will come to the Kaaba anyway. Do not take these blessings for granted. Allah is sharing them a parallel that they were better, stronger, richer people than you and we turned their circumstances because they were arrogant and denied. Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَئٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةٍ جَنَّتَانِ عَنْ يَمِينٍ وَشِمَالٍ كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لَهُ بَلْدَةً طَيِّبَةً وَرَبٌ غَفُورٌ Allah Akbar. Allah says, there was for the tribe of Saba in their dwelling place a sign, a sign for all of us. They had two fields of gardens on the right and on the left. And they were told, eat from the provisions of your Lord, but be grateful to him. A good land you have, and a forgiving Lord you have. That what you have, you have because you have a Lord that is forgiving. Allah says, فَأَعْرَضُوا فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِيمِ But they turned away, refusing, in arrogance. So we sent upon them the flood from the dam, and we replaced their two fields of gardens with gardens of bitter fruit and sparse lote trees. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this was the recompense for their own actions. Okay. Then, if we look at Surah Saba and compare it to the Surah before, we see that Allah describes at the opening of Surah Saba His sovereignty and ownership. Right at the opening of Surah Saba, Allah teaches us of His sovereignty and ownership. But subhanallah, if you ponder at the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah describes what only a being of His sovereignty and ownership can do. <laughs> because at the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah says, لِيُعَذِّبَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ وَالْمُشْرِكَاتِ وَيَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Allah says, Allah will punish the idolaters, the males from them and the females from them. And the hypocrites, the males from them and the females from them. And Allah will forgive the believers. Only the being of sovereignty can do this. So at the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah tells us what the being of sovereignty can do. And at the opening of Surah Saba, Allah establishes Himself as the being of sovereignty and mightiness. Subhanah. So here we see this connection. Also at the end of Ahzab, if I can take it further, Allah lists two names. Ghafoor and Rahim. وَيَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غفور الرحيمة. Did you guys hear this in the Taraweeh? وكان الله غفور الرحيمة. غفور رحيم. Listen to the order. غفور رحيم. The eloquence of the Quran. At the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah tells us that He is غفور and رحيم. At the end of Ahzab, at the opening of Saba, Allah says وهو الرحيم الغفور. <laughs> سبحان الله. رحيم comes first and غفور comes second. At the end of Ahzab, Ghafoor first, Rahim second. At the opening of Saba, it switched. Look at the connection between the surahs. Did you know this, Yahya? Did you notice this? SubhanAllah. But you read it all the time. Amazing, huh? The Quran. Tayyib. What else? 
in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah tells us how the disbelievers asked about Qiyamah in the form of making fun of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes we do this. We ask a question, istihza'an. You ask a question to make fun of somebody. You treat them as a fool. So you come to a gathering and you ask the question to make other people see them to be a fool. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in Surah Al-Ahzab, He tells us about what the disbelievers used to do. In Surah Saba, Allah details their denial in the hereafter. So you see this connection as well. Subhanallah, surah complementing a surah. A message complementing a message. In Surah Saba, we see a great focus on the oneness of Allah, the messenger being God sent, and life after death, which were key elements that the Quraysh used to deny. Then we get to Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is a Makki surah. So, Madani, Makki, Makki. How many verses? 45. And it's called Fatir because of the opening of the surah. The first of ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises himself with alhamd. By the way, this is another surah that starts with alhamd. And he says, Fatir, the originator and creator of the heavens and the earth. Fatir doesn't just mean creator, it means the originator. Because a creator can be someone who creates from something. But an originator is someone who creates from nothing. Subhanallah. So Fatir qualifies the name of Allah al-Khaliq. That when you understand Allah is the creator, you understand it in the absolute term. That he is the creator, but not the one who is a dependent creator. He's an independent creator. He can create from nothing. And from the Sahaba were those who would say, Subhanallah, this word Fatir, we didn't know its meaning. This is how deep the Arabic language is. And I believe it was Abdullah ibn Abbas, if I'm not mistaken, radiallahu anhumah. He said, we were struggling with Fatir. Until one day I was in the desert and I saw two Bedouins fighting over a well. And one said, Ana fatartu. And the other one said, Ana fatartu. <laughs> right? Meaning one was saying, I'm the one who brought the water out of this. And the other one said, no, I'm the one. It's my well. He said, no, it's my well. Because I heard them using the term. I said, subhanallah. The one who brought something out of nothing. It was sand before and now there's a water flowing. So he understood exactly what this term means. This is the depth of the Arabic language. That even the Sahaba would grow the understanding of the Quran based on the interaction with the different tribes. And we're fortunate in this masjid because we have a, we have a, a riwayah, a different, a different mode of recitation by Imam Suhaib. And then we have Hafs and Asim by the rest. And you can see, subhanAllah, different meanings coming out based on the different words that are used in some places. This is from the beauty of the Quran. Okay. Surah Fatir is also known as Surah Malaika. Because in the opening, Allah tells us how he decreed for angels to be the middle process between him and his messengers. That it was the decree of Allah. He is the one who originated the angels from nothing and made them this middle link between him and his, his, his messengers. He doesn't need them. He's not dependent on them. If he was dependent on them, he wouldn't, they would have been there. But he created them. To show the Quraysh that this is, not a, this is not a process of dependency. This is a process by choosing. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen it to be. Tayyib. The relationship to Surah Saba. They both begin with, with Alhamd. I'm sure you picked this up from today's reading. With Alhamd. And also they are similar in length. In terms of the contents, similar to the Meccan Surahs. It's big on dismantling the foundations of idol worship. It's big on presenting rational discussions on the evidence of God and that he does exist and that he's the only one worthy of worship. So it's not only revealed evidence, but rational evidences. We see this. The topic of steadfastness upon Tawheed, irrespective of the trend, is also revealed in the surah. The Muslims are guided to this. And then we moved into surah Yasin. Inshallah, surah Yasin, we will uh, discuss tomorrow. Bidhinlahi um, ta'ala. Oh, very quickly, because mashallah, did you read extra, ya Handala? You went up at four, uh, he, he did read extra. Okay, let, me, let me share with you some of Surah Yasin, inshallah. Surah Yasin is a Meccan Surah, consisting of 83 verses. And it's called Yasin because Allah begins it with Yasin. And earlier, I told, taught you all about the disjointed letters. That these are letters from the Arabic language and something to note. And it's in the book that's going around. I have the discussion. Habibi, don't hold the book, pass it along. Mashallah. Um, the disjointed letters, if you see in the Quran, whenever it's used immediately after that, Allah talks about the Quran. Yasin wal Quran al Hakim. Allah speaks about the Quran. Alif Lam Mim Dalik al Kitab. Alif Lam Mim Sad Kitabun Anzalnahu Yalik. We see the Quran being mentioned immediately after these letters. And for those who missed it, it's as if Allah is telling the Arabs that look, these are letters from your Arab, from your alphabet. 
These are letters from your alphabet that we've used to reveal this Quran. And there's a challenge to you to produce one ayah that can beat it. Tayyib. What are the contents of Surah Yasin? Similar to what we discussed earlier. Um, similar to all what we see in Meccan Surahs. Establishing Tawheed, the messenger being sent, the fact that Allah exists, rational evidence to his existence, and so on and so forth. What's, it con what's its connection to Surah Fatir? In Surah Fatir, the attitude of the Quraysh in the denial of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being sent as a warner was mentioned. At the opening of Surah Yasin, Allah answers and says, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ mursalin," That by the testimony of God, you are indeed God sent. Subhanallah. In Surah Fatir, there's details of how the Quraysh pursued their denial of the messenger being sent by God. Surah Yasin comes down and immediately squashes it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yasin wal Quran al Hakim inna kalamin al Mursalin. Indeed, by testimony of God, you are sent by God. Subhanallah. So, can you imagine you living at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this fitna is going on and then a verse comes down like this? Hmm? Subhanallah. Where would we be when these verses come down? Allah knows best. Um, khair, inshallah. Before we leave, brothers and sisters in Islam, I will continue with Surah Yasin tomorrow. But very quickly, um, just some key thoughts and key verses. Alhamdulillah, we are in the night of Al-Quran and the 21st of Ramadan and school holidays. So no, inshallah, huh? Dr. Said, no one has to run, run away, right? Otherwise, they might say, Sheikh is going on and on. Um, bear with me, I'm jet lagged. I'm between how many time zones at the moment? Uh, as the Imam was reading, firstly, subhanAllah, at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses from Surah Al-Ahzab, He teaches us that if you are going to do da'wah, you're going to have opposition. And if you are going to do da'wah, you have to be ready to be patient and be ready for the test. That is just the nature of it. Allah reveals that the believers, the true believers, they have no haraj in their hearts. They have no... Uneasiness in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made compulsory upon them. They are the ones you balligoona risalatillah. They are the ones who convey the message of Allah. And they don't fear anyone except Allah. This is the way of the true du'at. The way of the true believers. Yes, wisdom is needed. Nobody is saying <laughs> don't be wise. But the issue of what is the difference between you being wise by not doing something or you not doing it because really you fear? It's the haraj you feel in your heart. It's as if at the beginning of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah is teaching the parents, because we are all du'at by the way. A husband, you're a da'i to your wife. Father, mother, you're a da'i to your children. Children, you are a da'i to your parents. We all du'at to each other. Many of us forget about this. You know, parents struggle with their children and they start giving up and say, hey, you're a da'i. The Prophet, 23 years before Makkah became Muslim. You don't give up. You have to carry on. You're a da'i. But are you making moves because you really fear? But through cognitive, cognitive dissonance, you convincing yourself that you're doing the right thing by using the wisdom card? Sometimes you tell someone, brother, you're close to that person. Advise him. Wallahi, we just have to create a link. You know, we have to build a rapport. Have you heard this? Build a rapport. One year later, brother, I'm still building the rapport. Five years later, oh, it's a long grind to build rapport with this brother. I'm still building the rapport. <laughs> brother, how many lifetimes are you going to have, ya akhi? How many lifetimes does he have? Shouldn't our love and desire be to take as many people to paradise? If that is our desire, then get a move on, ya akhi. Maybe there's a pro problem in how you're building the rapport. <laughs> so is it really you have haraj? Allah says the believers, they don't have any haraj. They convey Allah's message. They don't fear anyone but Allah. Allah is enough for them. This is the way of the ummah. This is the way of the first generation of Islam. This is their way. لا يخافون في الله لوم تلائم as we read in during the first 10 nights of Ramadan that they are a people لا يخافون في الله they don't fear the complaint the 
um, refutation, the complaint of anyone. They don't call, they, they, they're not bothered about it. Sometimes you preach wisely, Akhi, and people take it the wrong way. This is where you say, listen, Lakum deenukum waliya deen. For you is your way, for me is my way. But Allah sent me, as Allah says in Surah Al Ahzab as well, Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadiran wa da'iyan ila Allah bi idhnihi wa sirajam muniran. I think you read it last night. Allah says, O oh Messenger, Inna arsalnaka, indeed we send you, shahidan as a witness, wa mubashiran as a giver of glad tidings, wa nadira and a warner, wa da'iyan and a caller, bi idhnihi, with the permission of Allah, wa sirajam munira, and we made you a lantern, a light. And then Allah says, and give glad tidings to the believer, that they will have from Allah a great fadl and benevolence. Those who follow you. And Allah says, وَلَا تُطْئِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ وَدَعَذَاهُمْ وَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Allah says, and do not follow the way of the disbelievers and the hypocrites. وَدَعَذَاهُمْ And leave their harm. Don't let it consume you. Don't pick it up. Don't make it something that you think about often. وَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Rather focus on your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Build your tawakkul in Allah. So this is what we learned uh, from Surah Al-Ahzab at the beginning. Also we learn, brothers and sisters in Islam, and I can't leave this because this is important to our time. The household of a believer. Male and female gender interaction. And this is a big thing because you have to know I do this daily, almost. As my role as a trained Islamic judge and an adjudicator and arbitrator, this is, this is what we do. And a lot of these issues boil down to not looking after the laws of Islam with regards to gender interaction in our homes, in our families. Whereby we put the culture and we put the norm and we put our whims and our fancies before the Quran and the Sunnah. And the day of Eid will come subhanallah and the khatib will stand here and tell you after a month of taqwa three times, fear Allah, fear Allah, fear Allah, meaning fear Allah's punishment. That don't let the Eid banquet after 30 days of righteousness be a mixed affair with non mahrams laughing and talking and joking with each other whilst they dress beautifully for one husband to look at another person's wife. To the extent that you find some men calling other people's wives by nicknames that their own husbands call them. This is the level of easiness that we have between us and this is not from Islam. Ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan. Allah didn't reveal this in any way. I'm saying it. Because Ahzab said, يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا We have to, I have to tell you as it is, even if you dislike me for saying it. It's the fact, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي O Messenger, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكْ Say to your wives, if you should desire the worldly life and its adornment, then come, I will provide for you and give you a gracious release from my household. You want the dunya? This is not the vision of this household. Allah reveals, if you want to sort out your household, you both have to be on the correct vision. The vision has to be united. The vision of the messenger is one of the hereafter. You have a vision for the dunya, no problem. I will give you the dunya by releasing you, go after the dunya. We're not compatible. So we see this tanzim coming, and this is to the, to the messenger and about our mothers, subhanallah. Because Allah is in control. The messenger, al-ain wa ra's, but Allah is Allah. Allah is revealing to his messenger. So you see the system being revealed. This is number one. Number two. وَمَنْ يَقْنُتْ مِنْكُنْ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِ وَتَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا Allah says, and whoever from your wives devoutly obeys Allah and his messenger and does righteousness, نُؤْتِهَا أَجْرَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ وَأَعْتَدْنَا لَهَا رِزْقًا كَرِيمًا We will give her double the reward and we have prepared for her a noble provision. Meaning a noble jannah. Subhanallah. Number three. Ya Nisa and Nabi, from addressing the Prophet, Allah addresses the wives of the Prophet, our mothers. Lastunnaka ahadim min an Nisa, you are not like anyone from amongst the women. In it taqaytunna fala taqda'na bil qawl. If you truly fear Allah, then do not be beautiful in your speech, soft and gentle in your speech. Why? Because naturally men can be enticed to you. Men have different levels of triggers when it comes to their desire. 
So be careful of this. Allah created you and Allah created them. He knows the female better than she knows herself. He knows the men better than he knows himself. Even if they don't show it, you don't know what's happening inside. You don't know what's happening inside. And what that gives birth to. It's a little lint that is lit. And then a flint that is lit. And then shaitan blows it. <sighs> Over time, it becomes something. Allah is telling, look, Allah is telling the mothers of the believers, do not be soft and gentle, that sweetness be direct in your speech. Do not beautify your voice when you speak to them. Lest he in whose heart is a disease should cover, should feel inclined to you. Allah says, speak appropriately. Short, sweet, to the point. Today what happens? Subhanallah. And we see this. Like I said, more cases than we like I know of. Brother, sister working together. At the beginning, they have rules. There's modesty, there's shyness. But over time, the rules, the sensitivity meter starts to drop. And then what was me, assalamu alaikum, becomes how are you, assalamu alaikum, how are you? And then after some time, subhanallah, you don't look okay, you're not well, subhanallah, okay, now it's about just health. Then maybe she has some turbulence at home. And then it's, ah, you look a bit stressed today. And then she needs to speak to someone, she starts speaking, what happens? Hmm? What happens? You think it's not natural for feelings to develop? Where, unfortunately, I have had to come across cases of sisters falling in love with the brother's best friend or even a relative. Falling in love, where she has had to admit it. That this is what's happened. It, I didn't intend it, it just happened. That you were busy and he was there for me. This is a reality, brothers and sisters in Islam. Inshallah, it's not a reality in your life, but know, know that these things happen. And these verses Allah has left to be recited till the day of Qiyamah for a reason. It's not storytelling. This is instructional. Now, like I said earlier, if this is to the mothers of the believers, then what about us? <laughs> What about the, the children of the mothers of the believers, if I can use that term so that we can create some sense in terms of our proximity to them. If this is the case with the wives of the messenger, what about ourselves, our daughters, our mothers? Then this whole idea of homeliness. You know, once I gave a lecture about the fifth Jews in the Quran, Allah said, وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ And I thought, subhanAllah, and I learned this from one of my close friends. And also the teachers of tafsir. Well, muhsanat. Have you ever thought how Allah describes a female as a castle? Muhsan is a castle. <laughs> Something preserved and protected. A female is preserved and protected. It's amazing. Because in Islamic law, she's protected by her father. Or she's protected by her brother. Or she's protected by her husband. Or she's protected by her son. Or she's protected by the Islamic state. The Baytul Mal. She doesn't have to go out and fend for herself. Have you ever thought about this? Allah calls her muhsan, she's a castle. A castle is something pre protected and preserved. It has walls protecting it. This is how Allah describes her. Allah in Surah Al-Ahzab says, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Allah says, for the people of Iman, the place of their qarar, the place of their solace, the place where they feel most comfortable at, is their home. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Allah is telling the wives of the messengers, and remain in your houses. And then Allah reveals in Surah Al-Ahzab the hijab. That if you have to leave your house, your hijab becomes your house. Take your castle with you. Put a fence around you and go out. That in your house you can remove the hijab. Because you are preserved by your home. But if you leave the walls of your home, take a home with you. Subhanallah. That this is, when you read these verses, you can see this is what Allah wants. It's not a matter of choice and comfort. This is what Allah wants. That when you show Allah yourself doing this, Allah loves you. Allah praises you. Imagine he tells his angels, look at Aisha, bint Fulan. Look at Maryam, bint Fulan. Shaitan made a promise that he was taking them to Jahannam. I bear witness, O oh angels, that this Aisha and this Maryam are for, from the, for the people of paradise, for the difficulty they have wearing their niqab in a hot summer's day in, in the UK. Meaning covering themselves with the hijab. This is where the Iman is. We spoke about the people of Gaza. What change are you, do you want to bring to your life? Are well, you still going to tinker with matters pertaining to your faith? Allah says, وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى And do not display yourselves as was the display of the former times of ignorance. So women used to wear makeup, literally paint themselves. To the extent that in the books of fiqh you find ideas if you go see the girl, how do you know her age? Because the makeup was so much, she could look 10 years younger. They say, look at her hands. 
The fuqaha will share guidance in the books of fiqh. They look at her hands. Her hands will give an idea of her, of her age. Because that's how much makeup they did. And even this whole idea of the niqab, by the way. Is it wajib? Is it not wajib? Firstly, all the scholars agree it's better. Shouldn't we do what is more beloved to Allah? Even if it's not compulsory. That's number one. Number two, they all agree that if she has makeup on, she has to cover. The issue of wajib, not wajib, should she cover, shouldn't she cover, is when she doesn't have makeup on her face. Today the sisters go out with makeup and tell you niqab is a difference of opinion. This is the wrong reading of the fiqh, to my understanding. May Allah forgive me if I'm misrepresenting the Quran and the Sunnah. But we can even deduce this from the verses even if we don't look into the books of the fuqaha. Allah says, Wala tabarrajna tabarrajul jahiliyyat rula. Do not go out beautified, made up like the women of jahiliyyah. Wa aqimna salah. Ah, now Allah tells us, tells the females what Allah wants from them. Wa aqimna salah. Establish the salah. Wa atina zakah. And give the zakah. Wa ati'na Allah. And obey Allah. Wa rasoolah. And his rasool. Inna ma yuridu Allah. Indeed, Allah only intends through these rules to remove from you the impurity of sin. And here he addresses the mothers of the believers, O oh, people of the prophetic household, and to purify you with extensive purification. I'm not going to go too much on this, but I wanted to leave this with you. One last verse from Surah Al Ahzab about this. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ ذَلِكَ أَطْهَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِمْ Allah tells the people, the Sahaba, that when you are in the prophetic household and he's hosting you, and you need something and you need to ask one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ for it, make sure you ask them whilst they are behind the covering, behind the veil. They should be covered. And Allah says, This is purer for your hearts and their hearts. Subhanallah. That even our mothers of the believers, they were human beings as well. And Allah forbade anyone marrying the mothers of the believers after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, it's 11 flat. We'll stop here inshaAllah. Alhamdulillah, we did the ibadah of uh, Isha, Maghrib, uh, and the adhkar of Maghrib. We did the ibadah of Isha. We did the ibadah of the, 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 the sunnah of Maghrib and Isha inshaAllah. And then we did the ibadah of Taraweeh. We've been with the Quran. And now we sat in a tafsir session. Allahu Akbar. What a beautiful start to the 21st night. Alhamdulillah. Right? You've, you've, have, you've had multiple relationships with the Quran through reading, through hearing, and now through learning. Alhamdulillah. Let us continue with that, inshallah. Protect your tongues, brothers and sisters in Islam. And everything I shared with you here is not for you to now talk about other people and don't message your wife and say, You see, that's a store. Don't even let your wife entertain you. Leave these discussions after Ramadan. Right now, take the message. And don't believe for one moment the message is for somebody else who should be here, because this is what happens sometimes. And I said this to you before. Sometimes the lecture happens, you think, Ya Salam, I wish that brother was here, Wallah. I wish that sister was here, Wallah. La, la, la. The message is for those who are here. Because we need reminders. There's no guarantee that we will be safe on our deathbed. So we should keep trying, having good hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept from us and make us from the family of Al-Quran in this life and the next. Not only in reading, not only in listening, but also in practice. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Tomorrow, inshallah, with Surah Yaseen. Hadha wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatuhu wa barakatuh.